Welcome to 28 and Searching. I'm your host, Samantha, and today I have Cully Pratt with me. Thanks, Cully, for coming on my show. Hey, not a problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, where are you currently residing? How old are you? How long you've been in your industry? That sort of thing. Okay, well, a um, little bit about myself. I, I'm 41 years young. Um, I currently reside in Northern California, um, about 40 miles north of San Francisco Bay Area. And I currently work in law enforcement for the last 15 years, did military prior to that for about nine years. But the last 20, 22 years, I've been doing freelance artwork, and I've made kind of a full-time, part-time gig about it. Wow. Okay. And so tell me a little bit about what you do. How do, how do the two jobs kind of come together for you? Well, it, it's kind of, kind of a unique mix. Um, I joined the Army about <laughs> 24 years ago because I wanted to go to art school. So I figured that would be kind of a means to an end to go to art school. So I started like in the infantry, which was kind of crazy. Um, it was supposed to be two years, turned into about nine years, and then um, never ended up making it to art school. And directly from uh, military, went into law enforcement, which is also very different than artwork. But the whole time I was doing uh, murals and portraits and for businesses and residences and started doing like a lot of painting and drawing and freelance artwork. And just over the years, I've just kind of picked it up and it kind of turned into woodwork, antique restoration. And now what I do is I primarily do um, wood wood trays. They're, they're called pocket dump trays. You ever hear of them? I have heard of them. Yes. <laughs> like almost it, like it, a ballet, it, right? Exactly. So so what we did is is I started this thing because I have a lot of friends who work within law enforcement and military and they're guys and they have a lot of toys and they have a lot of junk and they have a lot of things in their pocket and they all have – wives or girlfriends and people who get really tired of them leaving their stuff around the house. So um, I started creating these dump trays and I wasn't the only one, but a lot of people start really kind of liking the idea. Um, ladies would be like, you know, we really like that because my husband or boyfriend dumps his stuff everywhere and you yeah. can personalize them. <laughs> so, you know, so it came up with this kind of slogan and it's, it's stuck with for a while. It's like, uh, what do you give the guy that has everything a place to put it? So we start building these customized uh, dump trays and everybody's got a different unique story and it becomes kind of that gift that you give to uh, people that are hard to shop for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a brilliant slogan. If, if people are kind of listening to this and they're kind of curious about what you're doing, where can they find you on the web? Well, um, I primarily like I have a website. It's uh, I go under cullypepper.com. So www.cullypepper.com. But primarily I fall under my last name of Pratt. Uh, Cully Pratt, C-U-L-L-Y-P-R-A-T-T -T, on Instagram. I have a pretty decent sized following for a, a little side business and uh, just a lot of really great people. Um, network with a lot of local artists and other people who are really good in different fields. So we, we kind of trade uh, people who follow when we follow each each other and just kind of a, a lot of referrals, you know, based off that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. And so I have to ask this question and mainly yeah. because I come from a military family. So you don't often hear people say I'm going into the military for art school. I'm just trying to connect <laughs> the dots of how that thought process wound up in, in, in the workings of your life. It's actually Really great question because, yeah, I was um, definitely – there's not a lot of artists that join the military, let alone the infantry. But um, I was in the infantry and always kind of did pretty well, And but I did feel a little out of place. But I, I figured it would just be a couple of years, and a couple of years turned into a couple more years. And um, I started a family and had a couple of kids, and it just kind of put it on the, the back burner for a while. But um, I continued to keep doing it, so I find myself um, doing a lot of artwork – for like, you know, military installations and their Christmas cards and a lot of their freelance artwork. I would draw their uh, emblems and logos for the battalions and brigades. And it just became kind of known as a little local artist, you know. Yeah. And uh, but but, you know, I've always been really, really passionate about it. I, I, I like my job, but I don't live for my job. But I am definitely very passionate about artwork. So okay, it's it, it kind of turned a hobby into a, a pretty, pretty decent part time gig. Yeah, and how how did you kind of how did you do that? How did you get into the position you're in, um, where you know this is this is part of your livelihood? Well, I, it's a good, great question. I, I think a lot of it is just kind of a trial and error. You know, um, I always had a passion for it, and I, and I kind of noticed that a lot of the stuff I did, and there's a lot of people out there that are way better. I'll be the first to say it. You know, just incredibly gifted artists or painters or 
muralists or sculptors or anything. And I just had a passion for it. But um, I started doing it for people because they seemed like they were really interested in getting personalized gifts. And just kind of a sense of accomplishment sort of felt good. Um, I started almost doing anything for anyone if they'd be willing to pay me. Even if they couldn't pay me, I would do it. And then uh, I just kind of worked into a a position where I, I kind of found out what I felt my value was worth by the hour, I suppose. Sure. And I, re- I realized that a lot of people were okay with paying that. And I would rather do artwork than get called in to work overtime. So that's kind of what, what drove me, you know? Okay. And so you, you talked about wanting to go to art school. Do you think that having a degree or specific or specified training in this industry is a benefit or is it something that's a drawback or is it neither? You know, that's a really good question. And I kind of feel that it would be a different answer for different people. For me, um, I think it could have opened doors for me that I wouldn't have met of people like in law enforcement or within the industry that I currently work. But um, so, so I don't know if it would have really been beneficial. I, I noticed that a lot of people who are artistic are already artistic prior to going to art school. Mm-hmm. It's not like they go, or like you go, go to music school. Most of the time you're already pretty good at music. I always had kind of a natural talent when it came to drawing. I'd say I'm probably a better drawer than I am a painter or a sculptor or, or wood woodworker. But, um, but I, I, I think it, it gives you an opportunity to really network with really, interesting people, you know, when you, when you put, surround yourself with like-minded individuals. So I think it would have been a benefit that way, but I think no, no matter what, I kind of found that it's sort of something I'm passionate about and I find myself drawn back to it. Well, and when you're talking about, um, meeting people, it, it almost, so when I've talked to other artists or people who are doing different things, um, I had talked to this, this woman who's doing a collectivo where she's basically doing an art collective. Um, and she said that the market's super saturated. And so I think that, if if you're looking at you, you're you're going into a market where maybe it's not. I mean, when you talk about police officers or military, they're seen as maybe not uh, somebody that would go to like an art show. So you kind of have yeah. this this market that hasn't necessarily been tapped for what you're trying to do. You, you know what? I I kind of I agree with you. And um, I went I ended up going to college in between this time, which I kind of put off for a long time. It wasn't art school. I went to a um, University of Phoenix, and I ended up getting a, a bachelor's degree in business management and supervision. And I always had this wild idea to turn what I do, like Cully's artistic creations, into kind of a a way that blue collar people can enjoy art in a way that it's kind of funny. You know, like I I had murals on my wall when I was a young kid, and my mom and dad would let me just draw. Um, which sounds kind of weird, but they would we would draw like marvel characters and like spider-man hanging from the ceiling and different things like that and and it's all trial and error you know sometimes they look pretty good and sometimes they look kind of janky but you could always paint over it and kind of go so i started doing that and people picked it up and i just thought there was kind of a niche market because you see high-end art Mm -hmm. which i've never i've never bought a piece of high-end art i've never really been to an art gallery and i'll tell you right now i don't know the first thing about real real rules of painting so i've taught paint classes um have you ever seen the sip and paint wine classes yes i have seen those so i i started doing that last year Uh, my girlfriend and i start hosting those around here and once again we'd host them for primarily like law enforcement or military families or local people in the community and it was really great because you know you bring in you buy some tickets and it's a byob you can bring your own wine sit and teach people how to paint there's people who've never even picked up a paintbrush and we would go through and i'd kind of like paint and uh had kind of a little bob ross theme going on you know sit and sit and paint and we had a lot of fun doing it you know and did that for a while and then i kind of moved on to antique restoration and redoing furniture and then i got kind of passionate about uh repurposing old that people would throw away and turning it into something kind of neat you know yeah and that's just kind of been been what I've been doing, you know, but I do think it is kind of a niche market. You know, you got to kind of figure out what, what works. So. So when you talk about having a bachelor's degree um, in business, when you, when you, when you're starting your own company, do you think that's beneficial? Like if somebody wanted to go out and they're like, yeah, I'm an artist, but I want to start my own, 
you know, my own thing. Like I want to build furniture or I want to, you know, just sell my art on Etsy. Do you think having that training in business helps with creating that? Well, I'm going to sound really bad here, and I'm not saying anything negative about my school, but no, I, I really don't. I, I think that sometimes people too many, too often will go to school to get this formulated degree to start some company or business with the idea or aspirations of being the CEO of a major company with sure. zero experience, with no experience. So I kind of like tell my kids or my colleagues, I'm like, I just recommend if it's something you want to do. Don't make excuses on why you can't do it. Just really think about what it takes to start from step A and ultimately where you want to be at step Z and just kind of give yourself some daily goals and kind of work on it. Start doing it. And I, I'd say kind of create your portfolio is, in my opinion, way more experience than sitting in a classroom talking about um, how to do it. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. And so what type of – what do you think would be a good entry point for someone to find out if they wanted to do art as a business? As a business. Well, I think, I think it would have to be, um, for, for myself, there's a reason I work in law enforcement mm -hmm. and do a Monday through Friday or a Monday through Thursday type gig. Um, it provides me the opportunity to have a lot of time off. Um, I have an income coming in, so I'm not solely reliant on just doing art. Sure. You know, um, if I was to just quit law enforcement, then I would have to look into retirement. I'd have to look into benefits and I'd have to look into probably quadrupling the amount of artwork I do throughout the course of the, of the year over and over and over and over again. So I think you have to be kind of realistic mm -hmm. and set some attainable goals. Um, but really just do it. And I think so many people are so afraid of trying anything new that they don't ever try it. And when you look at most people who are pretty successful in whatever it is they decide on doing, they took that big step and, you know, took a shot and just, just tried something. Yeah. And most of those people do really well. Like how long have you been doing a podcast? My podcast has only been out since November. So awesome. So, <laughs> so the thing is there's no, but there's so many people who have these aspirations and dreams of, and they think, Hey, you know what? I, and I've listened to a lot of your podcast, mm. you know, and I think you do really well. And I think it's obviously something you're very good at and you make people feel real comfortable, but there's talking about it and then there's doing it. And I think the whole process of you contacting me, reaching out the, the finalizing it, everything was just so clear, cut and dry T's dot or you know T's crossed eyes dotted it was just really comfortable it's like a really comfortable environment and, and I think that's what you need you know just uh the ability to go out and do it instead of talking about it yeah I mean I'll tell you I had this idea for probably a year before I mm -hmm. did anything with it and then all of a sudden I was like I'm doing this and I gave myself a month to get it prepared and put together and I started in October and I booked you know, I have a full-time job as well, and then I go to school full-time, and then I do this podcast, and so I just booked as much free time as I could to do it, um, and I mean, I'd agree with you. If somebody wants, you know, somebody's passionate about something, they can try to make it a business in their spare time to see, you know, there's no, there's no harm in giving it a shot. Well, I tell you what, I think that's a very good point. I, I know early on... Um... Early on when I was younger, there was a time I, I found myself really frustrated about the military, you know, believe it or not. <laughs> and I, I, I had questioned myself, you know, hey, did I make the right decision? Is this what I really wanted to do? I had two young kids and there was a big part of me that was like, I should have done something else that I'm really passionate about. You know, yeah. I was good in the army, but I was like, this just isn't me. Um, but instead of accepting the fact that I couldn't do it full time, because in my mind, I had this. I had big, big dreams, like big goals. I was like, I want to paint huge murals all around the world. I, I'd like to be known and have my own thing, you know, like the Wyland, the Wailing Walls in Hawaii. You ever seen those? No, I haven't. He's I'll awesome. Have a guy named, yeah, Eric Wyland. He, he paints some of the hugest, incredible buildings and in like orcas on the side of a, like a 50 story building, you know, things like that, just like all around the country, all around the world. And just different thing. He had his own niche artwork 
And I, I was like, I want to just be known for something. I would like to be kind of a common household name. And yeah. it wasn't that I was dreamed of being famous, but I kind of had an idea that I, I could really be something bigger than a sergeant in the army. You know, not that that's not a good thing, but I just felt different. But I was so afraid of starting little that I just really put it off and didn't start at all. So I noticed that when I started it and I wrote down a goal, as silly as that sounds, basically like saying, okay, this is what I'd like to do. I would like to do four projects a month. Yeah. You know, which, yeah. which is just a little, little bit extra, basically something else to work on. It's like create my own little hobby for a month. That's 48 a year. If I can stay up on that. And that would be this much either money or that's how many I would get done. And I start realizing that when I put it down on paper and talk to people about it and actually just kind of tried to pitch my stuff, mm -hmm. I realized that it was kind of difficult because I'm not no longer looking at four. I'm thinking about four every month. So I really put a lot of focus on uh, referrals. Yeah. And I know a lot of small businesses do that, but I, I can't say enough about referrals. I'll tell you. 99.9999% of everything I do is based off of referrals. So people will always ask me, well, what website do you go to or what Instagram page do you go to? A lot of what I do is through Instagram. And if I do something for you, you'll say, hey, you know what? I kind of like this and you'll share it with your friends. And out of the 60 people who reply, I almost guarantee one person will be like, oh, that's kind of cool. Could I get one of those for Joe? But could he make it a blah, blah, blah? Yeah. And that's how I do it. So you just do really good for each person individually. And before you know it, it's kind of word of mouth will, will help. So I feel like that's went pretty well for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think referrals are, I think that's good. At, like that's a good notion to have for almost any small business period, because even right. in this podcast, 90% of my stuff's referrals, 10% is cold emails that I just randomly float out there to the world. But it's really awkward to ask people if they love their job. So I have to hope that somebody will tell somebody else about, you know, interviewing with me because it's hard to find that. And I, I'd imagine, you know, it's the same thing. I, like I said, I had um, a woman who's doing an art collective and she said that, you know, she she gives her art to her friends because then her friends put it somewhere where other people can see. And then other people are like, who did that? And then they want it and then they tell their friends and it just kind of expands from there. Yeah, I, I, I can't say enough about the referrals and I can't say enough about surrounding yourself with people with similar interest. You know, like um, it, it's like positivity creates positivity, you know, like action almost kind of causes reaction. So it's like. If you ever find yourself sort of in a rut, you know, really kind of take a look at the people you're hanging around with. And if they're kind of doing a whole lot of nothing and not really positively motivating you or you're one of those people that don't seem to motivate your friends, you know, maybe just kind of check it out. Because I work with I work with a couple people in my life. Uh, Christy Kuehl, who would be another incredible person for you to talk to. She's amazing. Her and her husband, Gary, they started a a basically a furniture flipping business about three, four years ago out of their yeah. garage. Yeah. And they've turned, they've turned it into a known all around the United States. They have a huge uh, inventory out here in Fairfield and she has her own paint line and she just does all these beautiful antiques that she goes around to estate sales and picks it up with her husband. And, but she, she's really made a incredible success story about it. Just, you know, going going for your goals and she she's great i i think she would be an incredible person another guy i work with roy stockton he uh he does leather work like i'm talking high high beautiful quality le leather work like stuff i you think don't even i see. saw him on instagram is he the high yeah, leather he, yeah he's my buddy man and, yeah. and and i'll tell you but i i start feeling like when i was working by myself i was getting kind of almost burnt out yeah because i'd work a full-time job and then on my days off i was working Hopefully the IRS isn't listening, but you know, like I was, <laughs> I was working, like I'd go into the office or the shop and I'd work from seven or 8 AM till about five every day and just, you know, covered in sawdust and it's fun, but you kind of lose your motivation or your passion for it. If, if you start feeling like it's, it's, it's a sweat factory, you know what I mean? So working with people that kind of keep you entertained and you can kind of, you know, do projects together are really, really awesome. So 
can't say enough about surrounding yourself with people who have similar interests, you know, it's yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. And so if, if we take that point and we move it and we go to what kind of personality traits are going to be the type that can succeed in an art business? Because it sounds like because I always assume that, you know, introverts would be because art's very lonely. Um, you know, it's usually not as collaborative unless, you know, you move in that direction. But you're saying that it can be super collaborative. Oh, I think it can be incredibly collaborative. Yeah, I think uh, I think it kind of takes all all things, and I think that uh, it's it's actually a really interesting question you ask because I've had people reach out to me, like say through Instagram, mm -hmm. right? And there's some places that are I get it a thousand times bigger than me, and I get it. Major corporations that are professional artists, and I I'm not saying I'm there yet, but I have a lot of people reach out to me who are incredibly talented like incredibly talented that just don't have much of a following. Maybe yeah. they don't have much personality that goes in with their work or they're just kind of, they don't know what to do with it once they have it. And those are some of those people that kind of fall into that, that realm of starving artist. You know what I mean? Sure. Where they're incredibly talented, but you don't know what to do with it. But you take somebody like Roy or Christy, and you surround yourself with people who are interested in that kind of stuff. And so what I tell people is the more you can get your artwork seen by more and more and more and more and more people, the more people will talk about it. So you can do that if you're introverted or extroverted. And sometimes it benefits to kind of partner up with somebody who might have a great mouthpiece but no artistic quality whatsoever. So what I kind of hear is I I'm, I know that networking is a big deal in any small business. I mean, most of the time networking in general is pretty big deal. But you're saying that basically if you're an artist and you struggle maybe with selling yourself, if you surround yourself with other artists who like what you do, it may ease that burden? Yep. I think definitely. I think you can collaborate. And there's some people, you know how like marriages are kind of yin and yang, right? There's There's like – the husband and wife or the, the couple kind of balances them to self out because one person's a little of this, the other person's a little of that. Sure. Well, in the same in small companies, you know what I mean? If you, if you're the full package and you can run everything by yourself, a hundred percent, you know, you can get a hundred percent of the proceeds. However, you can be lacking in certain qualities. Like I'll tell you, I'll be the first to say analytically, I'm, re I'm, I'm not very good. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a, I'm a mess, you know, I'm a mess. So, I was running my business off of like scratch pads and notebooks and, you know, I'd like make a list and it'd be scribbled and, and, and you know, crossed out and it was just a big nightmare, you know? Um, so I reached out to somebody who I know who is a family friend and she's incredibly analytically smart, like just, just great a number cruncher. And I have to share a portion of the proceeds that I get from some of these things I do, but the amount of time and effort and stress I would have had to put into balancing all that. Yeah. She, she does it just at such ease and grace. Like she answers a lot of emails. She answers a lot of replies. She does a lot of stuff on a website. She does a lot of things that I guess I could learn to do, but I never slow down because I'm too busy covered in sawdust. Sure. So <laughs> it, it, it totally is worth it in exchange, you know? Yeah. The funny thing is, I mean, this is this is slightly off topic, but in my personal okay. life, I actually um, exercise that same rule. Um, I hate cleaning. Like, I hate dishes. I hate all of it. Like, I'm very go-getter. Like, I want to do businesses with all my spare time. So I hire somebody because it's more important to me to spend that money to have somebody else do it than for you know, me it, to waste it, my money, you know, my time making money for me to do it. it. <laughs> you you want to know what? Exactly. Exactly. And I'm not one of those people that I think money buys happiness, mm -hmm. right? People say, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. I understand. But, you know, it's really hard to not smile when you're on a jet ski, you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. It's like, it's like, I don't, I don't have a jet ski, right? However, yeah. <laughs> there's a, like, I don't have a lot of money, but sure. I also know that being able to do what I want to do and be able to make a little bit of extra money doing it and it's therapeutic and it's kind of relaxing and I can share laughs with people that I enjoy in kind of a partnership. It definitely takes a stress away when you, you have a hobby that in turn can pay you. So I found myself working a lot on my days off for overtime. Yeah. 
And I'm like, I don't exactly love my job, let alone do I want to give up all of my days off doing a job that I don't exactly love. I'm good at it and I'm comfortable at it, sure. but I really like it for the reasons that it allows me the opportunity to do what I really want when I'm off. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I told people and without getting too much into money, I, I told people, you have to figure out what your time is worth. Yeah. So like you said about cleaning, if you don't like cleaning, and it takes you a full day off to clean, then is it is it worth the amount of money that you would pay, you know, to, to just have it done so you don't have to deal with it? And to me, I, I think it is worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's certain things that are, you know, hey, some people get off on it and they love it. <laughs> well, and honestly, when I've talked to a lot of people and, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who love their job and a common theme isn't necessarily how much money people make. So some people, it is about like, they do want money. That is what makes them happy. So they do jobs that make them that money. And other people love what they do and they make the money to have the life that they love. So it's very, money's very fluid. It's very relative. Um, right. There's, there's a thing, and I'm sure you've, you sound very smart, but there's a three minute and 10 second segment on YouTube. And it's by a really incredible um, speaker. And I, I, for, I forget his name and I'll come up with it. I just don't want to say the wrong name because I'm yeah. being recorded, but, <laughs> yeah, um, you'll have to email me it when you come up with it. Right. I, I will. And it's called if, if money were no object, have you ever heard of that? I don't think I have. Okay. So it, it's basically the premise is what would you do if money was no object? Sure. And wh whatever you say, We've been basically bred to to say, well, if money were no object, I would be a painter, or I would ride horses, or I would work with animals, or I would I would do whatever it is you say if money was no object. But what they've seen in people is the next thing people say is, well, obviously you can't do that because there's no money in that. You know, you can't do that. So what they'll do is they'll in turn spend all their time and their effort trying to get a job to make enough money to not do what they want to do. And I think that the main difference between people who start small businesses or ventures or believe in themselves is they take that first step and they say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about making money. I'm just going to start doing it. And if you do it good and you do it well and you basically put enough effort into it, then eventually you'll master your craft. And once you master your craft, there's a price on everything because sure. basically – People, people will pay. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you do your podcast lo long enough and hard enough and enough people listen and enough people are inspired, then before you know it, advertisements come and people are all about it. And then it's like the Howard Stern thing. You know, he he just did Howard Stern. And before you know it, it's like you become huge. So I think that people get all skewed and they're so worried about making the money instead of just really putting enough time and effort into really doing something different and mastering it to where people will sit back and be like, holy cow, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Sure. You, got, you put a different spin on it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so if we're talking about, um, you know, being in the business of art, because being in, and I say the business of art, because it's very different than somebody who just wants to do, you know, do art without creating a business. Cause you have to deal with, like you said, you pay somebody to do your books kind of thing, you know? So that, that all comes with having a business. Right. So what, what is the personality trait that you think will, is like the one thing that if somebody has, they should just steer clear of being in the art business, just stay with, you know, sketching on their spare time and find something oh. else they love. <laughs> that, that's, um, let's see here. If they have something, I would say being realistic is something that you got, you got to be, you, you have to look at art as a way. I, I, I think people get into it with an idea that it's a means to an end and it can be, but you have to also be realistic. It's kind of like being an actor, you know, um, if you act enough and you apply enough and you put it out there enough, then hey, you could be world renowned and you could be the man. But until then, you got to be able and willing to do something to kind of keep your head afloat, you know. Sure. Um, but I think that people don't want to balance it, so I think you got to be kind of realistic. Um, that that that's a big one for me. Um, and 
I guess a little bit patient, but you also got to be a, a little bit hungry. You you got to really be able to put your stuff out there and create something that's a little bit different than everyone else is doing because everyone knows that we live in an internet generation. Yeah. So if you want to buy a pocket dump tray and you want a pocket dump tray for the least amount of money in the world, it probably won't be handmade. It probably won't be hand painted. It probably won't be hand stained, steeled, whatever. It'll be mass produced. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think you, you got to really kind of believe in what it is you're doing and figure out a way to market it to people that are interested. And I think that that's something I'm figuring out. And I've been lucky enough to get some pretty good plugs from people and shout outs from people who maybe have more people than I, than I have, but it kind of points me in the right direction. And it's one thing to get those shout outs and plugs, but it's another thing to do something with them. Yeah. And I can say, I haven't had to turn anybody down, you know, in the last couple of years that I've been doing it and I've really had to plug, plug away. So it's a lot of work, but you know, just kind of believe in, in your craft and work hard to make it unique. You know, I think that's, yeah. that's the big thing. And so what's a, what's a piece of you that's kind of struggled with, uh, you know, turning your art into a business? What's something that you've had to either change yourself or you've had to change what you're doing, um, to kind of become successful in what you, in what you do? Man, you got good questions. You're really good at this. Thank you. Um, I already forgot your question. No, no, you said so. What's something I had to no? So something I had to change. Um, I feel like I'm harping on it, but for me, it was I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the owner of a corporation that basically would. I hope this doesn't sound bad, but almost like an art pimp. Like you know, I <laughs> sure. I love the idea. I love the idea of employing young artists that work under the umbrella of my name to create incredible works of art for people who didn't think they could afford art, you know, from wall murals or designing kids rooms to like saying, Hey, I have a child and she has a little mermaid bedspread. Well, let's turn the whole room into an underwater scene, you know, or mm -hmm. let's turn game rooms into like real legit game rooms, or let's take Xbox, PlayStation, PS4 games and create a whole scene or scenery on all four walls and ceiling, like just really just beefing it up, you know, like really. Um, and then I thought about doing homes for like street of dreams types homes, like custom homes where I could go in with real estate agents and they would say, would you like to customize your daughter's bedroom or your boy's bedroom or your game room yeah. and it, have it, have it wrapped into the package of the house. So I had all these huge major aspirations for this major company that I wanted to run with basically no money in the bank <laughs> or no experience. <laughs> so instead of starting little, which I drug my feet, there was years. There was years that I didn't paint or draw or sculpt or do any woodworking because I was kind of in a rut. I was like, uh, I can't do exactly what I want to do, so I won't do anything. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think just like you – making a list, putting it down, um, and starting a little action kind of caused a chain reaction of just keeping me going. And I can say I've done it every day for the past few years. And I feel really good that I actually started something and saw it through and, and pretty, pretty happy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so what are some of the drawbacks of your career choice about starting this business? I think some of the drawbacks are, um, if you ask, you shall receive. Um, you're as busy as you want to be. And sometimes I want to be really busy. And sometimes I sit back and I go, what am I doing? <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. You know, I work a full time job plus and I, I work in a pretty cool line of work, you know, and it's afforded me an opportunity to do a lot of cool stuff. But when I'm off, it's really nice to be off. Um, I think I'd say some of the drawbacks is I have to balance my time and be, be realistic and be able to say, you know, I want to help everybody who's interested in buying something for me. I think it'd be pretty awesome. But on the same hand, I, I need to be able to say, Hey, you know what? No, I need a couple of days off. Sure. And so yeah. this one's always one that people have a little bit of a tough time with, but what bring has it, been, <laughs> what has been the worst day of your career so far? Wow. 
worst day of my career doing the art business? Um, that is a tough question. Um, it's been really positive and that's not what you wanted to hear. I'd say the worst, <laughs> the worst day of doing my career as an art business. You know what? Um, you're not going to please everybody all the time. Yeah. There's, there's times where you're doing this because you're passionate about it. And I'd say a good majority of people you work for are going to be happy. They're paying you because they're not very artistically qualified and um, they're just happy to get anything from you. But I, I'm not really huge on uh, rejection. You know, if somebody, if I do something and I put my heart and soul into it and somebody doesn't like it, I'm like, ugh, this sucks. So I remember doing an, a mural for somebody that I was young and I bit off more than I can chew and I didn't feel comfortable doing it. And about halfway through, I realized I'm painting on this beautiful home and I've, I've caused all this damage. <laughs> and they're just kind of looking at me like, oh, man, this isn't like what I oh, intended no. it to be. And I felt kind of nervous. You know, that, that's one yeah. day that I remember because I just didn't click. Like when I was there, I was like, man, I'll give you whatever money you gave me to, to let me leave. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, but no. I've already. Caught, but but that, that's just one of those things like yeah. real, realizing that. Wait, you know, you could be a waiter or a bartender and you, no matter how great you are, you're going to get that client that just is mad and oh, they're yeah. going to take it out and they're just not happy with it. So realizing as an artist that I can be selective and uh, I have been selective you on, should probably. on how people act and treat and kind of trust your gut a little bit. If you feel like somebody's sort of a pain in the ass from the get go. Yeah. And maybe it's just, it's just better to kind of say, tell them you're too busy and surround yourself with positive people. Cause most of the time when they're pain in the ass, you're not going to get a referral from them anyway. They're going to be unhappy with the product they order. And, uh, so, you know, just kind of be, be realistic. You have, you have to do enough, butt kissing on your real job. <laughs> <laughs> and so then if we, let's, let's change it and say, what has been the best day of your art career so far? The other 99.99% of it, okay. I, I'm being, I'm being really serious in that. Um, I genuinely love completing a project. Like I really, really enjoy getting challenged with something, starting with nothing at the end of the day, ending with something and having somebody be like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. Or that's man, that maybe even exceeded what they wanted. You know, like yeah. starting with nothing, ending with something that sense of completion at the end of the day um, is just awesome. And, you know, I, I, I've always kind of really, really liked that. I mean, I just I, I like that sense of accomplishment. I like that sense of kind of pride when you get done creating something that somebody wanted and, and they're not just paying you, but they're asking you to create something for them that is a spe special gift that you can't just go down to target or Walmart and buy, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it feels, feels pretty good. So yeah. and I so re really enjoy it. What are some of the other benefits besides, I mean, obviously that <laughs> What would be some of the other ones. Oh, um, well, with, with like my business, um, I'm, I'm big on, I, I, I like the idea of repurposing things. I, I think there's a lot of quality that goes into like antiques. Like when you look at how things were built in the 1800s and early 1900s, it's just, you can't go to Ikea and buy it or purchase it, you know, and it's weathered the storm for the last hundred years. And it's just sitting there and kind of like a, I don't know anything about cars, but you look at a, an old car and it's kind of a, a piece of art, but going, being able to kind of go and give it new purpose, new life, put it in a home and have, has a backstory. I like, I like that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of frivolous throwing away of things that can be repurposed and resalvaged. Yeah. Um, my partner and I, we do that a lot. We work in the county and I'm a deputy out here and you just see people take down old barns or thousands of feet or hundreds of feet of fence, you know, yeah. that's weathered and aged over the years and they think it's just trash and they'll throw it away. However, if you cut the, the two ends off of each side, you have this beautiful board. And I, I know it sounds corny, but you have this beautiful board that has like 
years and years and years of like stories on it, you know, and all you have to do is kind of clean it up, give it some love and personalize it and turn it into a gift and it'll stay in somebody's home for another 20 years, you know, or, yeah. or more. Yeah. And it, it's, I, I like that, you know, I, I like being able to, um, to do that. And I like being able to kind of take my kids out and let them know, Hey, there's ways of make, you know, doing different stuff. You don't have to just go in the military. You don't have to go in law enforcement, you, you know, public service. There, there's a lot of different things you can do to be creative and, you know, kind of line your pockets while you're doing it. Sure. And so do you think that having, do you, do you think that you'll move towards this becoming full-time? Do you think it's a viable full-time option? 100%. Yes. Okay. I think I'm, I think I'm spinning my wheels doing this job. <laughs> no, okay. um, no, 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 I'm, I'm joking. Um, I'm, I'm 41 years old and I, I've been thinking for a long time about it, it becoming this major thing. But I also understand it's not going to become this major thing until I'm ready for it to be a, a major thing. But I'm also OK with the fact that it's pretty cool the way it is. You know what I mean? Sure. It, it's kind of kind of finding that balance. Um, I like the amount of time I spend doing art. I think that if I did it much more. Then it would maybe become a, a full time job and it wouldn't be as is rewarding and fun. Okay. Um, so there's sometimes that I think of that. And then there's sometimes I really like the idea that taking a few baby steps and being patient is going to put me into a really good position to when I want to pop smoke and drop my retirement paperwork, even if it's early. Sure. I, I can, I can kind of do what I want when I want, how I want, where I want. And it, it's not restrictive to where I live in the country or what size house I live in or anything like that. It's just, and it's not restrictive to my age. So yeah, I can true. do it well, well into my late years of life. You know, I'll probably live to be about 180. So, <laughs> so you I got, got a another, while to go. I got a hundred, I got another 139 years of this. So. <laughs> and so do you, do you currently have any expansion plans for, um, it, it's Cully's artistic designs, right? No, Cully's artistic creations. Creations. Oh, I'm yeah. So I got I, I really got to, I really got to come up with another name. I'm just, I'm just going <laughs> to call it, I'm going to call it Chris Pratt's brother. I think people like that. Book. <laughs> That's hilarious. So yeah, Chris Pratt's brother artwork. I think that'll that'll go oh over a little bit better. Than... That's so funny. <laughs> so do you, do you have expansion plans for it? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said yes. I'd like to sound okay. professional and say yes, but um, but you're kind of going with the flow right now. It's, it's I'm going. I, I'm to, I'm totally going with the flow. Um, a big part of me wants to really be able to keep up. And really come up with some great ideas. I think this this next year, my buddy Roy um, and I, we, we have some really big ideas for like guy gifts, girl gifts, specialized gifts, things that you basically create or bring to a house that are like, wow, pieces of artwork. I think we want to do a lot of stuff for the military. And we have like a line of um, like products that we would like to kind of really push to spouses of military okay. uh, people. Yeah. You know, the stay at home mom, stay at home dads type things like this. Um, start building things with like a lot of military. Or I'm not saying conservative values, but maybe more like faith, family, freedom type sure. type stuff to where you're like, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different niches. So I think together we're going to kind of put our heads on and start really creating different ideas to where people are like, whoa, I need one of those. And they can't really put their finger on why they need one, but they just think they do. So your so your expansion plans are you you do have them. I mean you're basically looking at a market and you're wanting to expand more inside sure. that market. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I I think that uh, it, it's just kind of creating bigger, better, badder, nicer qualities of work and being able to expand my reach. I'd really like um, my reach to double, if not quadruple, by the end of the year because I think that it's totally feasible. Um, I think social media is a gold mine for artists that yes. if, the, if you're not using it, you need to. Um, and there's things that I, I need to step up and do better, you know? So if anyone's listening, if you do awesome websites or you do, you know, even like internet, I might even be interested in somebody doing my marketing. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's all, it's all relative and all it's all balanced. So that is, I think the, the problem that a lot of artists have, they are incredible artists 
but they don't know how to do a website. They don't know how to market themselves. They don't know how to talk to people. And they would just rather sit in a coffee shop drawing pretty pictures, and never let anybody look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you need to surround yourself with enough people to kind of complete that circle and, um, and, the, and it'll work. Absolutely. And so you said you've been doing art like pretty, you know, since you were a kid, what kind of made you fall in love with art? Wow. Great question. Um, my dad, my dad, um, was a really blue collar, hardworking, really gruff type, like, you know, big boy and like really large man, kind of a lumberjack type guy. Okay. But he was a, he was a general contractor and worked really, really hard. But all of the work he did was really, really beautiful. Like he did really custom stuff. And if he did something, he always kind of preached, if you're going to do something, do it right. Yeah. Do, do it one time. And, um, he was really artistic. He would never sit down and draw or paint or anything. He was too grumpy, but <laughs> he, he would sit down and I always kind of had a, a knack for drawing and things can, came pretty easy to me when it came to drawing. And I remember he was always really, really critical, <laughs> like, really, <laughs> like, but, but not critical in a mean way, but like in a really honest way. Sure. And yeah. I always had kind of a, a desire like a lot of kids to, to really be you know, cool with dad or whatever. I draw something and, you know, a lot of parents are like, Oh, that's so wonderful. And he'd be realistic. <laughs> he'd be like, <laughs> huh. well, you want me to, he's like, huh? Okay. Well, do you want my honest opinion? And I'd be like, Oh shoot. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd be like, I remember him being like, D look at your arm. Do you, do you think arms look like that? And I would have drawn it like a little spaghetti man or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, look at your shoulder. It's got a shoulder. And then it, it goes to a bicep and behind it's a tricep. And then you have a joint and below that joint, you have a forearm and then you have this and your palms. And he would tell me story. He would tell me things like it's not within proportion. Your hands that you drew are way too big for that person or the head is way too small. And he kind of let me know by based. He, he'd say, don't draw it the way you think it should look, draw it the way it looks. Yeah. And I would be like, wow, cool. Or he'd be like, Hey, erase this, or this is too much. And I used to draw people like he man, you know, like everybody had way too much muscles and the sure. girls were tiny waist, huge butts. Yeah, exactly. But he basically showed me like proportion and that things you know, have proportion in a human head is like eight bodies high and like the hands are as long as the forearm and just little things like that. That's probably things I would have learned in art school, but he was just real, real honest with me. And I remember he was super critical initially. And then he would get to the point where he was kind of a fan. He'd be like, now this is good. Now this looks good. And I found myself really pushing and I draw dragons and he's like, now that looks good. That's your thing. You're really good at dragons. And then I'm drawing dragons, you know, <laughs> you're and taking the compliment. He, right. But he pushed me to do things that most dads wouldn't let you do. Like sure. I was really into Marvel, you know, my, obviously my, me and my brother into Marvel and, but he, he, like I said, he let us draw on our walls. He's like, why not? If it looks bad, you could just draw over it. Yeah. Or, you know, paint over it. And so we would draw like these, it's almost like a eight by 10 foot canvas. And I would draw like scenes and, and, but he really pushed me to do it and kind of gave me the confidence to do it, but was really critical while doing it in a weird way. So I guess that kind of answers your question, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So we've kind of gone over what it means to, own an art business to kind of do, um, sell your art. So I just have a few more questions for you. What did you want okay. to be when you were a kid? Oh, when I was a kid? Yeah. Um, wow. I, <laughs> I all I knew is I didn't want to be a cop or in the army. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't avoid no. either of those. No, I, um, I, I wanted to, create stuff. I wanted to build things. I, I, I thought it would have been kind of cool to um, get into like building custom decks, mm -hmm. but I always had an idea. I'd be a cartoonist like um, 
like I I, th- I thought I would end up being an artist of some sort, like a professional artist, like drawing. I like the idea of starting with nothing and ending with something, but I was I was kind of dead set on creating something, and I, and I thought it would be very artistic, whatever I ended up doing. So um, you've come full circle. Yeah, I kind of came full circle, I guess. Perfect. And so what is the best piece of business advice you've received? Um, best piece of business advice I've received is there's that three, three minute, 10 second video really inspired yeah. me. And I, I totally forget his first name, but I'll send it to you. And it's incredible. Yeah. It's and I'll put it up on my, I'll put it up on my website. That was inspiring. And as soon as I get off the phone with you, I'll remember his name. And then, <laughs> um, have you ever watched the program, the secret? I haven't. You have to. Okay. I'm passing that on to you. If you, I, if I can pass anything on to you as an entrepreneur, as your listeners and whatever, sit down, give up 45 minutes of your life and really listen to that thing. It's incredible. It's very, very, very inspiring. And they talk about everybody kind of wants to know the secret of life and nobody really does. However, when you look at the top 1% of the world, in any industry or any field, there's something a little bit different about each and every one of them. And they kind of do a study on what makes people click and quirk. And really what it comes down to is kind of believing in yourself and starting roots and following it and understanding that you have to believe it to be true or it's not going to be true. It's, it's really, really great. Yeah, that and sounds right up my alley. <laughs> you, have, you have to watch it. I'm, I'm telling you, you'll love it. I and after, after you watch it, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it again because it's it really is great. Yeah, my friend, my friend Christy told me about the secret, and I watched it, and I'm not kidding. I I think it genuinely really affected and kind of changed my perspective on things. Yeah, I'll have to put a link up too. And so, what is? What is one thing you would tell somebody who's struggling trying to find what they love to do? What's one piece of advice you would give them? I would say if you have to think really, really hard about what you're passionate about, you're not passionate about it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, thank you for spending this conversation with me, Kali. It was great having you on. It was really nice. And thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. If you like this episode or you're looking to change your career, go to 28andsearching.com or become a patron to get exclusive content sent directly to you. See you next week.